This week on the agenda, supplying the future. Is the world really ready for the fourth industrial revolution? Over the past few years, global supply chains have come under pressure like never before. Geopolitical events, COVID and conflict, as well as increasing demand for critical minerals to underpin new technology, has changed the way manufacturing operates forever. But the World Economic Forum is providing what it hopes is a beacon to companies looking to embrace change with its global lighthouse network. With me now to explain more is Enno de Burr, senior partner at McKinsey and Company. He leads the firm's global work in digital manufacturing. Great to see you, Anna. Now, first of all, let, let's set the scene. Talk us through the main challenges companies and economies are facing that they weren't a year ago, or at least pre-pandemic. So the situation for supply chains have fundamentally changed. Um, we're coming out of a decade of growth. Um, then we had the pandemic with lots of supply chain shocks. And now we are in an era that is marked by inflationary cost pressure, um, shortage on cash for the company, so they need to figure out how to better turn their inventories, uh, but also um, a lot of challenges in terms of uh, upcoming supply disruptions or resiliency, and then clearly a demand for sustainability. So coming all that together, and, and we are still um, having parts of companies really growing fast, so um, it's, it's really a challenging time for supply chains. But where there are challenges, there, there are opportunities, aren't there? So where are those opportunities to, to seize that competitive advantage and build more resilient supply chains? Yeah, so there are many um, opportunities. And I think the good news is that um, there's technology out there that has been proven over the last five years that can solve some of the issues. I give you a couple of examples. Inflationary cost pressure. We have now tools like spend analytics in procurement that allow us to much better understand how can we run our supply chain. We have tools, um, we call them smart capacity, that allow us to uh, create more output out of our supply chains without putting more assets to play, which is very important because we're in a cash-constrained environment. And then I think on the, on the supply disruptions, we have much more transparency with uh, digitization uh, that's coming that is helping us to really understand where supply chain issues might come in the next couple of months and then react proactively. So, so I think the, 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 the real opportunity is here to bring the full suite of digital technologies to our shop floor and with that solve all these problems that we are facing at the moment. Where does the Global Lighthouse Network fit into all of that? So the good news is we're doing this for the last five years. We have started this platform in 2018 and, and we have looked at what are the best supply chains in the world doing in terms of digital adoption? But more important, how are they contributing to solve the biggest challenges? How do they um, create smart capacity? How do they um, uh, are more agile? How are they um, creating sustainable supply chains? And how are they more resilient? And we have now um, on the platform um, 132 lighthouses. Um, that are really go-see examples where companies can go and learn from the best how to apply technology in a, in a very kind of outcome-based, impact-based way. So um, we're very excited that we have started this work so early and have now kind of the breadth of experience there that we um, can offer to anyone who wants to jump on this bandwagon and wants to, to, to literally innovate their supply chains. You talk about jumping on the bandwagon. It's interesting, though, isn't it? Because companies, large and small, they, they talk about their, their digital transformations. But are they all really on a journey? I mean, I wonder to what extent everyone is just paying lip service to this, ticking a box, or if meaningful change is really being implemented. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, you're having a really good point. And it's a, it's a little bit of a disappointment for, for me personally, because um, you're quite right. Uh, there's many, many companies still that are uh, doing lip service and that are saying like, yeah, we are on the digital journey. And, and they truly believe that. And I, I cannot blame them for that. But what they are doing, um, we, we call the pilot purgatory. They are piloting uh, things in isolation and it's really not returning. If you put your finger to it, it's not returning anything. So I would not count those to be really meaningful at pace on the digital journey. Then there are a couple of other companies, uh, quite frankly, that haven't kind of innovated and uh, improved their supply chain over the last years as they should have. And and they are now in a in a in a in a dire situation. So. They, they need to do much more shorter term things and, and cannot just kind of um, really fundamentally improve their supply chain. And then I think the, 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 the shiny light are our lighthouses and um, a couple of companies that are really understanding that. I would say like the uh, maybe 10% uh, of the companies are really understanding and are on a meaningful um, way and a journey to, to, to get the benefits out of digital. Okay, so we're acknowledging then that supply chains have become a bit clunky, that, that, that need a revamp, but not everybody has access to the same resources and certainly not to, to the financing that might be needed to, to jazz it all up, certainly not overnight. So where should companies start? Is it with people? Um, so, so definitely with people. This entire transformation is about augmenting the operator augmenting our people to, to do their job in a safer environment, more productive, with less repetitive tasks. Um, it's, it's really about augmenting. Now, um, I would say um, having not the resources, again, is not an excuse because you can create a self-funding journey um, where you're picking use cases like digital performance management, like digital standard operating procedures, very simple use cases that immediately return and are, uh, don't need a lot of investment. And, and you start with those and you put with that money in the bank. And with that money, you invest into the more complicated use cases. So there's a way of doing that without a lot of um, upfront investment needed. Um, and clearly, um, you're totally right. Put the people into the center because um, this is um, about really augmenting how we how we get more uh, productivity, but also more output um, out of the same assets. Uh, and what about sustainability? I mean, is is there always going to be this trade-off between people, profit, the planet? That's a very good question. So, so we have seen that in the very early days that actually you don't need to make this trade-off. Um, for example, one of the first uh, sustainability lighthouses uh, was the Henkel factory. And what they did is they created um, uh, through sensors a data lake. And with that data lake, they were feeding at the same time use cases to reduce energy and water consumption by over 30%, but also driving productivity um, uh, quite substantially. So, so, so with the same underlying technology infrastructure, um, doing it right, you can get outputs that um, are good for the people um, because they, they, they make the job safer and better that are good for the planet because you use less energy, less water, you create less waste. Um, and at the same time, you're driving productivity. So I think this is really about doing this in a really smart way to, um, to get all the benefits and do with less more. Just rethinking the model, investing in new technologies, hiring and training staff, it's expensive. Um, so where is the investment coming from? Where are the subsidies, subsidies going to come from? So, look, I will not say that you don't need to invest. If you want return, you need to invest. No, no, no gain without pain. Uh, that's, that's a gain. However, I think 
you don't need massive resources and you don't need massive investments. Most of these technologies are uh, software as a service, um, are, are technologies that are pay per go. So they don't need a ton of upfront investment. We are also not talking anymore as in, in the last era of automation about a lot of um, high invest physical automation. We're talking about mainly software technology data assets that need to be built. So it's sweat work, a sweat investment that needs to be done. So, so I, I think the, the, the answer to that is, of course, if you, if you have um, worked well over the last decade and you have kind of uh, put investments aside that you can now invest, you will be able to go faster. Um, however, if you haven't, then you know, need to go on a self-funding journey. And, and that's also good. Go on a self-funding journey, um, implement the first two, three use cases, return with that some money, and with that money, um, kind of invest into the next ones. I, I think that's the game today. Eno de Berth, thank you very much. Thank you. So that's the big picture, but how does all this work in practice? Well, one of the World Economic Forum's lighthouse companies is the Chinese appliance giant Medea, and the Europe region director of Medea Industrial Tech, Shui Rulong, joins me now. Thanks for coming um, on the agenda. Now, your business is huge. You operate around the world, but for those who aren't familiar with what you do, can, can you give us an idea of some of the big brands you have and where you operate? Media is a company, uh, actually is a home appliances company in the very beginning. And recently we grow to be a multiple uh, business companies such as the automation and uh, let's say uh, industrial key components. Uh, so all in all, we are growing to uh, uh, technology and innovative company. You're a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Lighthouse Network. How, how has that benefited the business? Um, let's say, first of all, the requirement of the lighthouse matches with the strategic uh, transforming direction with um, media industrial technology, so which is the digitalization. So being a member of Lighthouse Network is the result of consistent investment. So it provides an international standard and benchmark for us. And regarding the, the good side, and also uh, which help us most is to um, uh, increase our efficiency and also uh, improve the quality of our product. Uh, the most important thing is the as a digitalization and intellectualization of the manufacturing uh, help us a lot in uh, all kinds of business. Now, considering that the global reach and the um, diverse product range that, that you have, when one market isn't doing so well, you can maybe pivot, focus on other markets until things even out. Um, but that's not the only way that you've managed the supply chain squeeze that we've seen particularly over the last few years. So what is it about your business model and general approach that you think others can learn from? I think one of the key points that is the business mode of uh, innovation driven plus the high efficient production. So for example, the, tech, uh, the compressors and motors of media industrial technology are in leading position of the global market. So combining with the agility to satisfy the needs of the customer um, through the advantages of the high efficiency product. So we can invest in product development and technology upgrade to provide a value to our customer. So speaking in the past two or three years, let's say the, the, the COVID uh, era, um, in fact, from supply chain perspective, we keep deploying the global and local supply network to mitigate the potential risk, to build up a more reliable and resilient value chain. So from the view of delivery of our customer and consumers as media industrial technology, we are promoting the hybrid mode. So China for global plus the local for local. So we already uh, have built several overseas manufacturing bases to further improve our efficiency and delivery ability. And where yeah. does the innovation um, come into that in terms of what you're doing with your supply chain? I mean, can you give us some examples? You've got your, the, the T3 
business model, for example? Mm, for supply chain, because I think right now most of the business and maybe let's say companies, they focus their uh, supply chain uh, in China because China is the biggest uh, uh, country for all kinds of components, materials, and also China is the biggest market. But uh, let's say in the past three or five years that um, a lot of unexpected situation happens. So right now, uh, customer more and more focus on the local service and the local production. And uh, speaking of us, uh, we already deploy some uh, global uh, supply network uh, with our uh, overseas manufacturing basis. So just now I mentioned China supply local and local for local, uh, which means uh, local for local is that uh, if we have overseas basement, uh, we will develop our supply chain over there to uh, further mitigate any unexpected risk uh, like pandemic or, uh, let's say, geopolitics. So you, you talked about um, the, the COVID pandemic and that really heightened um, issues in, in terms of supply chains it, across sectors, across regions, especially when it came to things like semiconductor chips, which are, of course, crucial to your business. I mean, have those issues now been resolved? Um, let's say, in fact, media always invests in the supply chain safety and stability to decentralize the risk. So we build a local supply chain to keep the supply flexible and safe. And in the meantime, we will ensure the strategic material sufficient, such as uh, the kind you mentioned, the semiconductor. So uh, let's say in the, in the business growing uh, timing, uh, we are not sitting here and do nothing if everything is all right. So be prepared mentally and put it into uh, action is the most important thing. Do you think companies in general are paying attention to the fourth industrial revolution, the, the need to transform digitally, invest in innovation and technology? Um, for this topic, I think no one can deny it because standing on today, we have greater competition and faster changes in the industry. So companies can only maintain the competitiveness by get ready for industry 4.0, let's say, in order to obtain a more sustainable growth. But evolution is the start of the revolution. So companies should take small steps, evolutions to realize the industry 4.0. So let's talk about those small steps and how companies can, can build that resilience in. What, what, what should they do now um, to ensure that they're ready for, for, for the next shock, for the next challenge? Because that's going to be inevitable. I think first of all, it should be the mindset of the, all the managements of the companies. Because uh, I, I, I do believe that some uh, still thinking that whether we can uh, overcome the, the difficulties in the in current age using the past experience, but I believe that's not gonna work. So first of all, it's the mindset, and second, uh, if taking some actions in the, um, let's say that the company's operation, for example, the manufacturing, I think uh, very little small steps uh, could be, let's say, automation uh, deployment, and also some uh, IT and OT technology combination. So uh, putting all the operation uh, working flow into a uh, digitalization phase. Shui Rulong, thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come here on the agenda, the key to future supply chains, why critical minerals matter most. We are all connected, across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Hello, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of Southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history. 
far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So into the attention of world leaders. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control, the economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. And in these mountains, they recently finished building a power plant. Well, this is something completely different. The world today, every day on CGTN. Welcome back to The Agenda. From electric vehicles to smartphones, defence equipment to solar panels, the global economy relies on critical minerals more than ever before. So just how does that impact worldwide supply chains? Well, joining me now from Helsinki is Assistant Professor in Supply Chain Management and Social Responsibility at the Hanken School of Economics, Sarah Schiffling. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Now, as we've mentioned, they are the building blocks of products we use every day. So what exactly are critical minerals? Critical minerals are mineral resources that are essential to the economy and whose supply may be disrupted. What they are actually changes over time. So way back in history, just normal table salt was considered a critical mineral. Today, most critical minerals are central to the high-tech sector. So as you mentioned, most of us were probably familiar with those minerals as part of our smartphones. And how is demand for these minerals changing with net zero goals and ambitions? Demand for critical minerals has risen quite significantly in recent years, not just because of the personal electronics we all use all the time, but also because substances like copper, nickel or cobalt are used in many clean energy technologies like wind turbines, solar panels or electric vehicle batteries. A typical electric car requires about six times as much mineral input as a conventional car. Onshore wind plant requires nine times as much as a gas-fired power plant. And, and there are more and more. The, the rise of technology um, is a key issue, isn't it? I mean, as you've mentioned, electric vehicles, um, wind turbines, that demand for, for key minerals has really ramped up. I mean, the EU has named 14 critical raw minerals for 2011. Fast forward, and by 2020, that had risen to 30. Absolutely. Clean energy technologies are the fastest growing segment of demand for critical minerals. Soon they might account for 60 to 70 percent of demand for nickel and cobalt, almost 90 percent for lithium. The EU's first critical list of raw list of critical raw materials was indeed half as long as its fourth list, which is um, on right now. So things like bauxite, lithium, titanium, strontium were added to the list for the first time. And there are always some changes. So for example, helium, even though it remains a concern in terms of like where the supply comes from, it has been removed from the 2020 list because there's a decline in its economic importance. So it's no longer as critical. On the other hand, something like lithium, which is a core component for batteries, the global production is really, really concentrated in Chile, China and Argentina, accounting for together 96%. And the EU produces none of its own lithium. So that's a really big concern. So hence it's been added to the list in 2020. You, you mentioned the economic importance, but there, there's strategic um, concerns here, aren't there? Pivotal strategic mm -hmm. concerns around certain critical minerals. Yes, there are. They are critical to so many different industries that not having access to them would fundamentally alter product availability and industrial output across economies. Mineral extraction is not really an industry that you can just build up by investing a bit more and attracting the right, right labor force, because minerals are very unequally distributed around the globe. So for example, if we take cobalt, 95%, uh, 59%, sorry, of cobalt, uh, which is really important for batteries, magnets, catalysts, all sorts of tech. So 59% of that is produced in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The next largest supplier is China with about 7% of the global demand. So there's no easy replacement for that cobalt from the DRC. 
But the DRC is a country with a very challenging security situation. Supply chains there are frequently plagued with issues such as child labor, forced labor, as well as environmental concerns. Strategically, in an increasingly insecure geopolitical environment, there are also concerns because many of these critical minerals are necessary for the defense industry. So that's, of course, an area where countries are particularly keen to keep their supply chains as independent as possible. But that is very difficult in terms of critical minerals. So what strategies are nations employing to secure their access to these critical minerals? There are a couple of different strategies in play here. So first thing is usually strengthening the domestic sourcing where possible it plays a major role both for the extraction of the critical minerals, but also for processing of them, because it's not just a one step supply chain, you kind of need in between steps as well. Another strategy is diversification of supply, so sourcing from many different countries, so you're not just reliable on one of them. But of course, that is limited by who actually produces these minerals. And then maybe the most important strategy is reducing the dependency on virgin materials, so brand new ones that have just been mined for this purpose, and trying to tie into the circular economy mirror, have the reuse of resources. So very important to have recycling efforts for, for example, electric vehicle batteries, because a lot of these man minerals are quite rare and will be used up eventually with our ever-growing demand. So apart from all geopolitics, it is really crucial that we're investing in the circular reuse of these sort of minerals. You talk about geopolitics, but there are other outside influences, um, if you like. And I wonder, have vulnerabilities exposed by the COVID-19 snarl up perhaps served as a catalyst for redefining global mineral supply chains? I think all of the issues with supply chains in the wake of COVID have certainly highlighted just how dependent we are on global supply chains and how many things are shipped around the world globally that, as a normal consumer, you're maybe not really aware of. The issues with the critical minerals, they long predate COVID. So the EU list that you mentioned earlier, the first one was in 2011, so yeah. long before COVID. But there have been multiple events that have really increased the visibility of this vulnerability of our transport networks. And there's a lot ongoing right now on EU level. We've got quite a few research projects at the moment looking at resilience of transport networks. My team is involved in one of those. And what has been highlighted also, not just by COVID, but also by the war in Ukraine, for example, is the over-reliance on sourcing from one country. With Ukraine, that was, for example, some countries that rely very, very heavily on basic food products from Ukraine. And when those couldn't get out anymore, we saw massive rise in hunger in those countries. So we have had various events now that have really highlighted supply chains are crucial they're strategically very important they're very important for our day-to-day -day lives and critical minerals are a really key example of this because they're so important to so many different industries so how are you seeing governments and, and companies protecting themselves from future supply chain crunches I've already mentioned there's quite a few projects looking at different elements of this. There's also a lot of collaboration on this. So, for example, we've got in the EU the European Battery Alliance. Public and private investment has been mobilized at quite a large scale and should, for example, lead to about 80 percent of Europe's lithium demand being supplied from European sources in the next couple of years. There can be real opportunities here with this. Many EU battery raw material resources lie in regions that are heavily dependent on coal or carbon intensive industries historically. So investing in those new resources, those rare minerals, can actually be quite beneficial economically. So it is something that's ongoing, both at the governmental level, international level, and of course also for individual companies who are keen to ensure their security of supply in the longer term. Sarah Schiffling, thank you very much. Thank you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, the debt burden. How can the world fight back as global deficits reach a record high? But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.